One of the great blessings of my life is to have had the opportunity of working closely with five presidents of the church. President David O. McKay, Joseph Fielding Smith, Harold B. Lee, Spencer W. Kimball, and Ezra Taft Benson. Among their other great traits, I have found them to be humble men, soft-spoken, mild, kind, and gentle in leadership roles and relationships. Intimate experiences with each have helped me to know what I share with you today in firmness and conviction about mild voices. Personal calls and associations with them over the years have prompted me to appreciate the contents of Helaman chapter 5, verse 30. And it came to pass when they heard this voice and beheld that it was not a voice of thunder, neither was it a voice of great tumultuous noise, but behold, it was a still voice of perfect mildness, as if it had been a whisper and it did pierce even to the very soul. May I suggest to you, my associates at Brigham Young University, to listen to your leaders who administer with still voices and humble words. Too often we are inclined to be impressed with the loud, noisy, and dramatic. Students and members in general are sometimes led away from the paths of success because they are swayed by the sensational and artificial light. Very often in today's busy world, we ignore the quiet promptings of our leaders and those who guide with soft words. I'm pleased today to have my two very good friends, Roger Reed, head coach, and Charles Bradley, his assistant. If a camera can pick them up over here, they're seated next to Sister Ashton. Tony Engel, the other assistant, would be here, but he's out recruiting, and I hope with a degree of success. <clears throat> this isn't a pep rally or a celebration assembly. I could hope that would come later. For my purposes and theme today, I congratulate these three men for quiet voices and humble words as they have launched and carried on the BYU basket program this year. From the beginning it has been and still is a voice of oneness that carries a message, quote, we have no superstars, we're going to quietly work hard and without boisterous declarations or predictions. This approach is bringing unusual results. I commend these men for their on the court and off the court leadership. I had the special honor and privilege of being the last general authority that President David O. McKay called before his death. I recall with fear and trembling the impressions I can never forget that as I visited with him in his hotel used of apartment by appointment, I found him to be advanced in years and very weak in physical strength. As I sat with him in the privacy of his study, his body was frail, his voice was soft, and words did not come easily. After sitting in uncomfortable silence, waiting for him to compose himself enough to advise me as to the purpose of the appointment and visit, he finally said, in a still voice of perfect mildness, I want you to help me, close quote. That was my invitation. That was my call to be a general authority. That was one of my most unforgettable quiet experiences with President David O. McKay. After leaving his office, I felt I had a better understanding about the Savior's calling of his associates, whether it be on the shores of Galilee or the shops or paths of life. I'm certain that his invitation could have been nothing more or less than, quote, I want you to help me in proclaiming the gospel and being special witnesses to and for me. This experience more than 20 years ago brought a closest to me to President David O. McKay, a man I loved, admired, and respected over the years. Students, before this intimate association, I always had an idea that being called to be a general authority would be a complex procedure. 
Very often today as I prepare for conference talks, I find myself turning to the life and writings of President David O. McKay. He had a beautiful, intelligent capacity to not only say things in a meaningful way, but with warmth and spirit. He was a gentleman of high education and lofty principles. He had a quiet way of making me want to do better with each performance and assignment. I will always be grateful to him because he quietly called me, expect me in and wanted me to perform special services with him. I left my occupation and former business activities and responsibilities to help him as a prophet. Yes, I tremble today in remembering. He called me with a whisper that pierced my soul. All of my life I had a tremendous respect and high regard for Brother Joseph Fielding Smith as a scriptorian, historian, and writer. He was precise and firm in his living style. What a joy and a blessing it was for me when I came into the Council of the Twelve after two years as being an assistant to feel the sweet love and respect he not only had for his God, but for his associates. He was kind while at the same time led with vision and rigid commitment. He always took the time to express appreciation not only to his Heavenly Father, but to his associates. His kind expressions of encouragement to me under all circumstances will never be forgotten. He loved the Lord, and the Lord loved him. He, too, called me with a soft, mild voice of deep strength. When I was ordained an apostle and set apart as a member of the Council of Twelve under the prophet Joseph Fielding Smith, the charges I received at that time are still indelibly impressed upon my mind, particularly to be a special witness by example, word, and gentleness. Also, it was emphasized I was to listen to the still voice of the Spirit, which would now come in more frequent and powerful sequences in my life. Joseph Fielding Smith received his patriarchal blessing from Patriarch Joseph D. Smith in 1913. Included in this sweet and gentle blessing, he was promised that he would never be confounded as he defended the divinity of the prophet Joseph Smith and his mission. Quote, You have been blessed with ability to comprehend, to analyze, and defend the principles of truth above many of your fellows. And the time will come when the accumulative evidence that you have gathered will stand as a wall of defense against those who are seeking and will seek to destroy the evidence of the divinity of the mission of the prophet Joseph Smith. And in this defense, you will never be confounded. Close quote. Very often over the years of our association, I felt the intense strength of Joseph Fielding Smith as he served in mildness and with a soft voice. On many occasions, I have heard President Harold B. Lee share his powerful testimony in perfect mildness. One example, if you please, quote, With all my soul and conviction and knowing the seriousness and import of that testimony, I tell you that I know that he lives. I am conscious of his presence much of the time when I have needed him most. I have known it out of the whisperings of the night, the impressions of the daytime, when there were other things for which I was responsible and on which I could receive guidance. So I testify to you and tell you that he is closer to the leaders of this church than you have any idea. Listen to the leaders of the church and follow their footsteps in righteousness. If you would learn not only by study but also by faith, which testimony I bear most humbly and share sincerely in the name of Jesus Christ. From Harold B. Lee. President Lee was one of the most spiritual leaders I have ever known. 
he seemed to have continuous possession of the whisperings of the Spirit. He too encouraged me to lead in mildness and quiet patience. Very often, President Lee shared the following experience he had while serving as president at the Pioneer Stake in Salt Lake City. He felt that there was a lesson in it for all. He titled it, Tune Into the Lord. I love his soft-spoken yet powerful counseling in this instance. May I share it with you quickly? Quote, we had a very serious case that came to before our High Council in the State Presidency, which resulted in the excommunication of a man who had harmed a lovely young girl. After nearly an all-night session which resulted in that action, I went to my office rather weary the next morning to be confronted by a brother of this man whom we had had on trial the night before. This man said, I want you to know that my brother wasn't guilty of what you charged him with last night. Presently he said, how do you know he wasn't guilty? This man said, because I prayed and the Lord told me he was innocent. Presently he said, I asked him to come to my office and we sat down and I asked him, would you mind answering a few personal questions? He said in a loud voice, certainly not. Presently he said, how old are you? And he said, 47. What priest did you hold? He said he thought he was a teacher. Do you keep the word of wisdom? And he said, well, no. He used tobacco, it was obvious, as I said, across the desk from me. Do you pay your tithing? He said, no, I don't. And as long as that blinkety-blank, blinkety-blank bishop of ours is still in effect, I won't ever pay my tithing. I said, do you attend priesthood meetings? And he said, no, sir, and I don't intend to go to priesthood meetings as long as that guy's our bishop. <clears throat> do you intend to your sacrament meetings? No, sir. Do you have your family prayers? And he said, no. Do you study the scriptures? He said, well, my eyes have always been bad, and I haven't been able to read very much. Then presently said to him, in my home, I have a beautiful instrument called a radio. When everything is in good working order, we can dial to a certain station and pick up a speaker or voice of a singer all the way across the continent. But after we had used it for a long time, the little delicate instruments or electric devices on the inside called radio tubes began to wear out. The radio may sit there looking quite like it did before, but because of what has happened on the inside, we can hear nothing. Now I said, you and I have within our souls something like that that might be a counterpart of those radio tubes. We might have what we'd call a go to sacrament meeting tube, a keep the word of wisdom tube, a pay your tithing tube, have your family prayers tube, read the scriptures tube, and one of the most important that might be said to be the master tube of our whole soul we might call a keep yourself morally clean tube. If one of these becomes worn, presently declared, worn out by disuse or inactivity, or if we fail to keep the commandments of God, it has the same effect upon our spiritual selves that a worn out tube has a radio. And then he said in terrible majesty, now then, 15 of the best living men in the Pioneer State prayed last night. They heard the evidence of every man who was united in saying that your brother was guilty. Now you, who do none of these things, you say you prayed and you got an office answer. How would you explain that? Then this man gave an answer that I thought was classic. He said, well, presently, I think I must have gotten my answer from the wrong source. And you know, that's just as great a truth as we can have. We get our answers from the source of the power we listen to obey. If we're following the ways of the devil, we'll get answers from the devil. If we're keeping the commandments of God, we'll get our answers from God. This experience was first shared by President Harold B. Lee 40 years ago on the BYU campus. 
and it's just as true and applicable today as it was then. President Harold B. Lee served for 18 months, the shortest period of time of any prophet in our dispensation of time. He had a tremendous impact upon my life. Among other things, by example, he encouraged me and others to be quietly fearless in approaching and solving problems and individual behavior. At the same time, he pointed the way for me to show a warmth and tenderness in working with all mankind, regardless of where they had been or what they had done. Day after day contacts taught me presently to be firm and totally objective, while at the same time he had one of the most tender hearts I ever witnessed. He charged me to, quote, seek for that spiritual plus which will be added to your natural abilities, close quote. An unforgettable and frightening experience I once had with President Lee was when he invited me to come to his home to participate in giving a blessing to a very sick mutual friend. As we gathered with a few family members, President Lee asked me if I would anoint the brother's head with consecrated oil. This I did humbly and in a spirit of inadequacy. I had never before had the opportunity of the rich spiritual experience of having a prophet of God seal an anointing that I would pronounce. I recall with vividness, even today, presently sealing of this ordinance. As he went forward, it seemed to me he was struggling for words, direction, and guidance to give encouragement to this sick brother. I had the feeling he wanted to promise him complete recovery and health from a serious malady, but the words didn't come as he pronounced the seating. It was evident as the seconds passed he was not only troubled but groping for direction that would be positive and rewarding not only to the recipient but to others in the room who had grave concern over the individual's health. President Lee never did promise health, strength, and recovery to this individual. He gave words of encouragement and touched upon the basics of the total gospel plan, but the promise of healing was not forthcoming. Immediately following this experience, President Lee took me aside in another room and softly and in perfect mildness said, Marv, he's not going to get better, is he? I responded to President Lee, no. I could tell you wanted to promise this type of blessing, but it was apparently not to be. I recall his final statement as we walked away from the hearing of the family members. It was, the Lord has other plans, and he determines not only what we promise, but what will happen. I hope that we can remember that. President Spencer W. Kimball was a prophet of love. He loved God, our Savior Jesus Christ, and all mankind. He was a constant example of warmth and Christ-like love. His voice was one of perfect mildness, sometimes even less than a whisper. He was always gentle, firm, and fearless. Many of you will recall at one period in his life he was unable to speak at all because of throat cancer. Here are some of the gentle statements that President Kimball made just after becoming president of the church. All of these seem to be filled with deep love and human maintenance. His voice was never one of thunder, but rather perfect mildness and love. In regard to church policy on excommunication, he said, I think it will remain in the large measure as it has been. President Lee had felt very deeply that there must be some discipline in order to keep the church clean and free from the sins of the world. His comment about blacks and the priesthood, I'm not sure there will be a change, although there could be. We are under the dictates of our Heavenly Father, and this is not my policy or the church's policy. It is the policy of the Lord who has established it. And I know of no change, although we are subject to revelations of the Lord in case he should ever wish to make a change. 
in regard to the state of affairs in America. We believe that our people should sustain all the righteous activities and actions of their leaders. We do not feel there's going to be any total disruption. We hope that all may straighten out well and that America might go forward to its destination. We are teaching our people to be true and loyal to their respective governments. His quiet words in regard to a message to the members of the church. Our message is, as it always has been, and our hope is that our people will live the commandments of the Lord. They have been revealed in the Holy Scriptures and by the living prophets through these many years. President Spencer W. Kimball was one of the most kind and courageous men I have ever met in my life. His capacity to meet life's issues, life's disappointments, and life's successes with a proper balance and attitude are experiences I shall never forget. How sweet, how humble and sincere was his leadership style. His whispering voice pierced my heart as I would listen to him. One morning, early, my phone rang in the office. I picked it up before the secretary had come in. I recognized the soft voice of President Spencer W. Kimball on the other end of the line. After saying hello, to, saying hello to him, I heard him and his voice, weak voice say, Marv, I have something I want to talk to you about. Do you mind if I come up to your office and we visit? President of the church. I said, President Kim, if you'd like to talk to me, I'll be right down to your office. Would you like me to come? And he gently said, would you do that? courteous, friendly, and willing to be the servant of all. It was his leadership style to never demand or use the influence of his mighty calling to take the lead in what people would do or how they would respond to him. I would have you people today who are listening to me know that he could have said on the phone, Marv, this is President Kimball, get yourself down here. Come to my office right away. Certainly had the power, authority, and the right to ask me to meet under any and all circumstances. But I still have ringing in my ears today as at that time. When I volunteered to come to his office, he simply said, would you do that? He had the kind of approach, humility, mildness, and love that would inspire all of us to sustain and support him and love him under all conditions. A few days before he passed away, he was on the Lord's errand in the temple in Salt Lake on the fourth floor with his first presidency counselors and members of the 12. He was so weak and frail that there was every good reason he should never have been there. I tell you, he never should have been there that day. But out of duty, he was there. Before our meeting started, he sat. A member of the Twelve walked by to shake his hand and greet him. There was almost no response at all because of the physical drain that had come to him over the last number of months. There was almost no capacity to communicate or respond to the present situation. His hearing was very limited. His eyesight was failing. His frail body was filled with aches. As I shook his hand privately and felt little or no response, I gave it an extra squeeze and said, President Kimball, I'm Marv Ashton. How can I ever forget his last words to me when he looked up just a little and said, Marv Ashton, I love you. President Ezra Seth Benson, our present prophet, is a special friend. I love him and have respect for his life and leadership. I would remind you that he's your friend. He has always conveyed to me a relationship of complete trust and confidence. This sustaining reassurance on his part has made it possible for me when in near or distant places in the church 
to make decisions and calls that would be worthy because I knew he expected me to do just that. I have admired his constant reminding to all, not only his associates and high levels of the church, but to all members to work with diligence in building not only God's kingdom, but improving our personal lives. He is a man of total obedience. I see him following to the letter those paths of righteousness that the Lord has given him, the responsibility to point, direct, and lead. I have seen him cry with unashamed emotions as he talked about the wonders, content, and future of the Book of Mormon. Those of us who have been close to him have admired and respected the depth of his comments when we were making decisions of great importance to simply say after hearing a situation, let us do what is best for God's kingdom. Besides days, weeks, and months of close association, I recall conference sessions with him which include ward, stake, regional, and general conferences where he has always taken the occasion in the beginning to give encouragement and at the conclusion to offer thanks for the contributions that come of us as we make our way. He is a prophet who quietly builds up, delegates, and expects commitments that are unwavering. I've always enjoyed his referring to me as one of his brethren. I recall telephoning President Benson Walloway on a state conference. A major situation and problem was evident. It was serious enough that I felt I needed his help to make a decision. When I finished explaining the facts and developments to him, he simply said in a reassuring mildness and trust, you know what to do, do it. You have my complete confidence and support. President Benson's voice today is reduced almost to a whisper. He leads the First Presidency of the Council of Twelve and other general authorities and the entire church in the spirit of pure love and perfect mildness. Now in his 91st year and fifth year as president of the church, he leads in unwavering faith, persuasion, and a soft voice and penetrating humility. In all of my years of experience with him, I have never heard him raise his voice to a shout in moments of hurt or disappointment. I've seen him discipline and direct in mildness, patience, and pure love. How gentle yet powerful have been his words in leadership. These five prophets I have known so well have called and encouraged me in a voice of spirit and perfect mildness. I thank God for them. I pray God to help us remember true leaders always lead with mild voices, love, and persuasion. Calls and instructions from his prophets are tender and free of condemnation. With all my heart, I recommend we accept their leadership of mildness and love as we are invited to serve and improve our daily performances. God is our Father. Jesus is the Christ. I hope and pray I will be able to declare these truths in mildness, conviction, and great impact all the days of my life. These five wonderful prophets have done their part to try and teach me. Students, listen to the gentle promptings of the Spirit. Most often our hopes and prayers are best answered by impressions of perfect mildness. I leave you my testimony as to the truthfulness of the Church of Jesus Christ and pray God's blessings to be yours today and in the days to come. May your worthy words of prayer and petitions to God and his leaders be answered in a still voice of perfect mildness. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.